great. All right, so um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you all to Alicia. Um, Alicia Sanchez Gill, who um, is going to be opening us up today to talk to us all about and set the tone for the rest of the time we have together. Alicia is a queer Afro-Latinx survivor and advocate with nearly 20 years of experience in intersectional anti-violence and harm reduction work with organizations and collectives that center survivors who have often been left out of mainstream anti-violence movements. The belief that we will never end interpersonal and state gendered violence if we don't end the carceral state is central to her approach. After years of working in mainstream domestic violence and sexual assault organizations, Alicia helped create DC's first queer and trans people of color led transformative justice incubator for survivors of gendered violence. Her writing has been published and referenced in national media, academic journals, and a variety of digital out outlets. Alicia holds a master's of social work, but other survivors have been her best teachers. And with that, I will turn it over to Alicia. Beautiful, thank you so much, Deanna. And um, so good to be here with you all this morning. Deanna, I'll just ask that, um, yeah, we're on slide 11, if we can move back to the beginning and then we'll like take it from the, take it from the top. Um, but in the meantime, I guess folks will get a nice little sneak peek of, um, of the uh, PowerPoint. Um, so good morning to all. Um, I'm so thrilled to be with the North Carolina um, Sexual Violence Prevention Summit today. Um, thank you to the coalition for having me and thank you all so much for the work that you're doing to really lead the way forward as we zoom out just a little bit um, to get a better picture of the communities who've long been um, decentered from the, an the larger anti-violence movement. And I know that your work is really um, interrupting that paradigm. And so really grateful um, to you all for the work that you were leading and I'm grateful to be here with you on this really exciting and complicated morning. I kept joking via email that I missed this, the email sweet spot between um, Happy New Year's and there are white supremacists burning down the Capitol just five miles from my house. Um, so this is certainly a complicated time for all of us, um, certainly a complicated time in Washington, DC, um, and really grateful for that acknowledgement as we both hold space for this moment that we're in and hold space to talk about the connections between state and interpersonal violence. Um, an acknowledgement of our ASL and Spanish interpreters who are working to make this summit um, more accessible. We're really grateful to you all as well. Um, I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Piscataway people, um, also known sometimes as Washington, D.C. I honor my Piscataway siblings and I thank them for being good custodians of the land that we are on. And I stand in solidarity with their demands for land rights and sovereignty and an end to the violence that Native women face in this country. Um, I honor those of us who are descendants of enslaved Africans on this land, who toiled this land, who built this nation's wealth, um, and who are still being murdered by the police and by state violence today. Um, and so um, this morning, we're really grounded in our desire to honor survivors, um, particularly survivors at the margins. Um, we celebrate our struggle and our strength, and we also honor our past as we move boldly and unapologetically into um, a new future. What a what better day to kind of mark um, mark that moment. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, um, which I've included in my um, photo that I hope you can see. Um, and I'm a queer Afro-Puerto Rican survivor of both child sexual abuse and family violence. Um, and I'm also a social worker by trade. But for a living, I get to think about the way that gender norms, race, state, and personal violence and power impact our most close and personal relationships and also the world around us. Um, and I've spent most of my career, like many of you, um, in anti-violence organizations. I started my career at my local rape crisis center here in Washington, DC. Um, 
and moved into DV programs and kind of have pivoted between like local and national DV and sexual assault organizations, everything from capacity building and technical assistance to legislative advocacy and grassroots organizing. Um, and so I, you know, I, I'm extending deep empathy and gratitude for the work that you all are moving every single day in the midst of pandemics and uprisings in defense of Black life um, and threats to our safety and security. Security. We are, I'm so grateful for the work that you all lead. And as a survivor, um, it makes a huge difference in our lives, right? Um, as the interim executive director of Collective Action for Safe Spaces, which was my um, previous role, I began the creation of a queer and trans people of color led um, transformative justice incubator specifically for survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Our goal was really to meet the expressed needs of survivors of color who were asking for ways to hold harm doers accountable without having to go through state institutions or police. Our goal wasn't to take away options, but really to create an expansive network of resources that do not rely on the carceral state. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit more about the urgency of creating alternatives to the carceral system. In my own work as a social worker, as a survivor, engaged in a practice of healing and providing supportive services in community with other survivors of violence, and later as a researcher and policy analyst and technical assistance provider, um, I've learned two things to be really true and important. Um, one is that those of us who live at the intersections of multiple marginalized identities experience heightened and more severe violence, both at the hands of our partners or um, spouses and at the hands of the state. But also the, the other important part of that is that we are incredibly creative and resilient and we are already implementing community-based life-saving interventions to reduce violence, to access safety and to heal ourselves in our communities. We don't need saviors, right? So we are saving ourselves every day. Um, and I've learned that because other survivors have really been my best teachers. They taught me how to take care of myself and each other and about com concepts of abolition and a complete divestment from um, the state. Um, so next slide, please. And thanks to Deanna who's managing this as well. Actually the next one after that. Thank you, beautiful. So what is the carceral system? The formal definition, um, and I'm gonna get a little wonky here, so just bear with me. Uh, the formal definition is that it's the law enforcement officers who police the streets, it's the court marshals, it's lawyers, it's probation and parole officers, it's correctional officers. So it's all of the formal, formal institutions that buffer the, what we call the criminal legal system. Um, but I think of the carceral system as a really wide and expansive net of the ways that all that marginalized people and communities are really monitored and surveilled. So it's more than just policing. It really is about a wide and expansive net of surveillance and monitoring and sometimes control. Criminalization and racial profiling really shape and influence how police, how immigration officers, how school officials, and even how social workers interact with people of color. Um, they fuel a cycle of heightened surveillance um, and punishment with negative consequences for the people and communities who are targeted. This manifestation of racism at a very systemic level is at the heart of the disturbing and in some cases deadly incidences that we see in school, in immigration, and in law enforcement settings. Women of color, particularly Native and Black women, have a long history of entanglement with social services, such as Child Protective Services, for example. Survivors that we're working with, as we know, bring really historically founded fears of children being taken away when engaging with court systems where protection orders are found, or stigma from social workers when accessing psychosocial supports to heal from violence, or concerns about deportation when attempting to access services. All of these systems actually buffer what we call the carceral system or the carceral state. Um, and of course, in light of um, protests 
uh, all summer of 2020 um, in response to the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the multiple name and unnamed um, black and brown bodies who have been murdered by the state in particular black folks. Um, we saw a large kind of swelling of um, questions about the, the policing system and the prison system. And you may have heard terms like police abolition movements um, or defunding the police, right? So these are some terms that really came up um, across 2020. Um, and the police abolition movement is really a political movement that's largely based in the United States that advocates for replacing policing with other systems of public safety. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that policing is directly an outgrowth of slave patrols and prisons are a direct lineage of enslavement of my ancestors. And so the primary premise is often that policing as a system cannot be reformed because it is based on racialized patriarchal terror. Um, and in fact, for survivors of color, the state is often a primary enactor of patriarchal violence, of, um, of gender-based violence. And so that's a really important thing to acknowledge as we move on to, as we talk about the carceral system this morning. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is patriarchal violence? So I have a formal definition um, listed here, but I will just share two, right? So it's a framework that allows us to better understand the dynamic interconnected system of institutions, of practices, of policies, cultures, and beliefs, and behaviors that support and cause violence against women and girls who are cis and trans and other gender oppressed people. And it protects, normalizes, and condones the dangerous behavior of those who do harm most often. Um, patriarchal violence disproportionately harms Black girls, women, intersex, gender nonconforming, and other gender oppressed people. Patriarchal violence upholds, reproduces, and enacts patriarchy and other systems of oppression. So um, this is a definition that was created by an organization called Black Feminist Future, um, who I totally encourage you to check out. Um, and um, there's some logos at the bottom. So you can see, I think that's like Planned Parenthood, Collective Action for Safe Spaces, which is where I was when this, um, this definition was created. And we thought it was really important to have a term that really explicitly talked about the specific ways that women of color, and in particular Black women, experience gendered violence. Um, and also to talk about it as a, as a tool of patriarchy. Um, we know that gender-based violence or patriarchal violence is violence that, that is directed at a person because of their particular gender or that impacts particular genders disproportionately. Um, and we know that women who are trans and cis, cis and also gender non-conforming people bear a disproportionate burden of patriarchal violence. Um, and we know that there are diverse experiences of survivors who represent any and all and expansive genders, gender presentations and sexual orientations who are also at heightened risk of patriarchal violence. And so um, part of what this does is this, this definition helps us really put the onus where it belongs, which is on patriarchy versus on um, gender by itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about domestic violence and sexual assault advocacy. We're going to take a quick little history ride, um, so roll with me. Um, but first I want to talk about what I mean by advocacy. So advocacy includes the individual, the interpersonal, and the community level system practices that really help people change oppressive systems into highly resourced and equitable conditions. So advocacy really seeks to ensure that communities who experience exploitation, disempowerment, marginalization, disenfranchisement, and violence are able to achieve full human dignity. Advocacy can occur at multiple levels, ranging from self to the system. Um, and individual advocacy is employed to change the circumstances of one person. So when we talk about individual advocacy, what we typically mean is crisis support, um, individual case management, 
therapy, um, those things would be considered individual um, advocacy work. Um, interpersonal advocacy focuses on changing relationships that directly or indirectly um, influence people's lives. For example, in a community, um, housing advocates may develop a close relationship many of you have probably done this, um, a close relationship with landlords that can later be leveraged to um, get survivors access to housing, right? So we would see that as community advocacy. Um, that also describes the strategies or practices that can change a space that's bounded by ge geography, ideology, or identity. This could include things like organizing a protest or establishing a school within a neighborhood that engages in like public awareness campaigns um, within a specific community. And then of course, um, system level advocacy. So any attempt to change um, the culture, policies, processes, practices, or procedures within an institution, whether that's um, your um, state level institutions, city or local municipality institutions, whether that's getting access to a sane nurse within um, your community, those kinds of system changes we would consider system advocacy. And at each of these levels, advocates are working to understand how to generate more resources, more options, more compassion and more knowledge to improve, um, to improve survivors' lives. Um, the gender-based violence field really began as advocacy in forms of individual kind of informal networks that provided victims support, um, mutual aid, as well as family caregiving. Um, survivors of violence have been connecting with one another for as long as surviving has existed. Many um, of the advocacy interventions that we see now that are common in our social services, in our rape crisis centers, really began as volunteer-led work and as survivor community-led projects. For example, the DC Rape Crisis Center, which is where I started my career, um, one of the first and oldest rape crisis centers in the country, began in 1972 as an all-volunteer network of survivors who were using arts and theater, who were doing peer advocacy, um, and a hotline that was run out of a survivor's home, right? That's probably the story of many of our, um, of our organizations or of our rape crisis centers or the organizations that we are in that are providing survivor support. Um, this kind of self-advocacy really kept survivors connected and able to build relationships with one another. Survivors were finding their way to each other through word of mouth, through personal ads, um, and through feminist publications before the internet and before the Me Too movement. Um, and in every community, survivors were really creating hyper-local culturally specific interventions um, to respond to interpersonal violence. But as more and more survivors began seeking support from these kinds of networks and organizations, um, these collectives began to develop to meet the growing need of survivors. The rates of violence hadn't necessarily increased, yet people were coming, becoming more politicized and aware of the violence that they were experiencing. And so between, you know, from 1871 to the 70s, law after law was created, including the ability to issue civil protection orders, um, moving sexual assault and domestic violence from an inside the home conversation to a national conversation and fueling a movement known as the sexual violence movement and the battered women's movement from which many of our organizations sprang. These explicitly um, feminist values used a mutual aid approach, a peer-to-peer non-hierarchical model of shared leadership and shared expertise. Um, and then concurrently, these organizations were working to not just provide direct support for survivors, but also to shift patriarchy in all of its forms within the public sphere. So we were organizing marches like Take Back the Night as early as 1975 to give sexual assault survivors um, a place to talk about their experience. Um, our, our predecessors, for some of us, and our elders, right, rallied, passed out flyers, conducted public disruption and direct action, right? They began 
conducting things that would later be called in our um, organization's community education, a type of community advocacy that really focuses on responding to and preventing um, sexual violence. Um, today, in a community education pro program specifically work with um, men and boys on toxic masculinity. There are children's programs to help children understand their bodies and consent and healthy boundaries. There are trainings for parents on how to recognize abuse and trainings um, for the public about bystander intervention. Um, and many of these things, like I said, sprung out of like the late 70s and a really peer-to-peer survivor-led model of providing support to one another. These programs were incredible and hyper local um, and community specific, which is, an, which is an amazing gift. But as advocates began to petition their local and state governments for changes to legislation that would protect survivors, they soon understood that legislation could be varied state by state that often confused survivors and often allowed people who've done harm to evade accountability by moving or crossing state lines. Um, in more progressive states, laws were quickly being passed to protect survivors. However, in other communities, survivors had a really hard time accessing services and finding safety because there was no federal um, legislation to protect survivors across the board. So then laws around sexual assault and domestic violence were inconsistent, right? Statutory rape laws varied, and in many communities, marital rape laws were non-existent. So advocates and organizers knew that in order to get the wide scale um, systemic change that they sought for all survivors, no matter which state they lived in, they needed to engage in federal legislative advocacy. So next slide. Um, there's a quick timeline. You might need to click it a couple of times. Nice, thank you. Beautiful. Um, in response, the first legislation on interpersonal violence was passed. So that was the Family Violence Prevention Act, or FIPSA, which became the first federal funding in 1984, specifically dedicated to emergency shelter and supportive services for uh, survivors of domestic violence and their children. Um, and in, you know, it, it was passed in 1984, and as it was reauthorized in subsequent years, it expanded to include teen dating violence um, and interacts with other pieces of federal legislation like the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, the Violence Against Women Act, which I'll talk a little bit about, and the Elder Justice Act. Um, in 1984, also, Congress passed um, the Victims of Crime Act, which was created to compensate victims of interpersonal violence for costs incurred while surviving, right? And of course, while there's no price tag on the experience of violence, um, we know it's very expensive and that survivors often experience severe economic hardship as a result of job loss, moving for safety reasons, medical costs, and child care costs. So VOCA really sought to mitigate some of those, those expenses. A decade later, in 1994, landmark legislation, the Violence Against Women Act would pass, um, co-authored by um, President-elect Joe Biden. Um, and it was really considered a victory for the Violence Against Women at the time, which is what it was called, movement. Um, it coordinated criminal justice responses with social services and federal funding, and it publicly for the first time perhaps acknowledged interpersonal violence and sexual assault as a public health issue um, versus kind of an, a, you know, an in your house sweep under the rug issue. Um, I think what's really important though to name about VAWA is that it was not a standalone legislation designed only or solely to protect survivors. VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, was rolled into a larger suite of crime bills called the Violent Crime and Law Enforcement Act, commonly known as the Crime Bill, um, a bill that was often that we have later understood to expand militaristic policing, mass incarceration, and punitive responses to gender-based violence. In our direct service organizations, as we were providing support for survivors of interpersonal violence, we saw that there was a, an increased need for funding, right? For housing, for supportive services. Um, as more people became politicized about their experiences of violence, more people began um, seeking services. Therefore, the need for state intervention and funding also began, right? And that kind of 
in some ways deteriorated the foundational and core beliefs of many of these organizations. They began moving further and further away from the liberatory and mutual aid models of um, kind of our original understanding of rape crisis support to adaptations of nonprofit hierarchy. And so often in order to assert our own legitimacy, these collectives of survivors begin formalizing ourselves. So several things were happening at the same time with mixed results. Organizations were deepening their own engagement with the police, right? So we were starting to like actually instead of working outside of policing systems because those systems weren't working for us, we began to engage with the police and criminal legal systems. We were engaging with child protective services and family service agencies, and we were increasing what we call the professionalization of the work um, and moving away from survivor-led models towards more um, dependence on state funding and also dependence on like specific degrees, like social work degrees, for example. Often in our work, these early on, it was led by survivors themselves. We worked out of homes, out of YWCAs, um, and sometimes out of churches or other civic agencies. We had little interaction with police and courts because they weren't yet prosecuting these types of violence. Um, and so this really helped us create solutions to um, and safety planning outside of those kinds of systems. Um, instead, we relied on informal networks to connect survivors to services and housing. With the expansion of this kind of legislation, so FIPSA and VAWA, um, and the tough on crime approach, many of our organizations began to become pretty complicit with um, policing tactics with the intention, of course, of keeping survivors safe. In order to ensure that survivors had access to things like crime victims compensation and orders of protection, those survivors typically needed to fill out um, to file criminal charges against the person abusing or harming them. Um, further, in some communities, uh, we saw that prosecutors offices created things like no drop rules. And that is essentially for survivors who've expressed fear of prosecution of the um, or reluctance to carry out um, a criminal case against their abuser. These no drop or no or pro prosecution policies actually ensured that prosecutors could follow through on a case without the survivor's consent um, or request um, if they had evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Of course, given the dynamics of interpersonal violence and in particular domestic violence and the risk of leaving for survivors, it seems then that survivors were really making a rational choice about their own safety when deciding how and when to engage in criminal legal systems. The state continuing to prosecute without a survivor's consent in the name of public safety proves, I think, what many prison abolitionists believe, which is that prosecution is often for the benefit of the state and not survivor-centered. It's often punitive and not restorative or transformative and goes against our survivor-centered values um, and our values of consent. Next slide, please. Wonderful. Survivors of color in particular, um, so I just want to name what's on the slide just for um, accessibility purposes. Um, so the slide says that the anti-violence movement has historically pitted the safety of different communities against each other. Women who are Black, Latinx, queer, trans, Muslim, immigrants, sex workers, homeless, or all of the above cannot separate their other layers of marginalization from their womanhood. If solutions to violence against women cause violence against other marginalized communities, they are not solutions. So survivors of color are navigating a very complex web of social inequality stemming from longstanding policies and laws, often guided by biased research. From this country's you know, early history of colonization, slavery, unethical me medical experimentation on black bodies, to the criminalization of sex work, which allows for racialized and gendered police profiling and abuse of transgender and cisgender women of color, to sexual assault of children in ICE detention, to the um, uh, sterilization of women in ICE detention without their consent. The roots of personal and state violence against marginalized bodies are well, well formed. <laughs> 
And so what I'm saying to you is that women of color and our children experience violence at the hands of our partners and at the hands of the state simultaneously. Um, over the summer, we saw Jacob Blake's children who were in the car when he was shot in 2020. Um, a few years before, we saw Corinne Gaines, who was holding her son in her arms when she was shot. Charlena Lyles, who was a survivor of domestic violence, had her children at home when she called the police for um, a domestic violence call um, because she thought someone was breaking into her home um, and was experiencing a mental health crisis and was shot by the police. And so if we care about children of color and if we care about survivors, I'm suggesting that, um, and maybe I'm not even suggesting, maybe I'm being explicit, so let's see. Um, I'm telling you, right, that, the, that our reliance on the carceral state is killing us. The unintended consequences of past domestic violence and sexual assault laws and policy have often disproportionately impacted women and girls of color, um, leading to increased policing in our communities, leading to mandatory arrests, leading to escalation of violence and excessive force by police officers and other first responders to domestic violence calls. Um, while transgender and cisgender women of color and particularly black women um, are more likely to experience death as a result of domestic violence when compared to white women, um, we cannot always depend on the police to keep us safe. In fact, though black women and girls are only 13% of the population of the female population in the United States, we account for 33% of all women shot to death by police. In addition, um, sexual assault and sexual violence is the most, the second most frequently reported form of police misconduct after excessive force. These policies have really proved how dangerous it is for many survivors um, and impossible for some. For many survivors, particularly for survivors of color, for immigrant survivors, for LGBTQ survivors and other marginalized survivors, police and courts have historically not been seen as a beacon of safety or protection. Um, and due to that long standing relationship between historically marginalized communities and police and other state institutions, many survivors express reluctance to engage with those systems. Marginalized survivors often describe fear of increased policing in their communities as one reason they experience reluctance. Um, they express fear of deportation, which dis dis disproportionately also impacts communities of color. They express fears of not being believed by the police. Um, we express fears of dual arrest policies and fear of police violence. Um, given the widespread violence enacted by policing institution, many activists, including survivors ourselves, are calling for a divestment and engaging with these systems altogether, and instead, an investment in other forms of safety and accountability practices. Um, the Alliance for Safety and Justice, a community-based nonprofit that's in California, conducted a quantitative study examining how victims of multiple forms of violence viewed safety and justice. What they found was that the majority of people who have been harmed, including survivors of the most violent acts, actually wanted rehabilitation and behavior change for the people who caused harm um, and not jail. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that while VAWA allowed for greater prosecution of violence against women, it also expanded the role of criminal legal systems in the lives of survivors, particularly, again, for survivors of color. Um, between mandatory arrest policies and expanded dual arrests, it gave the police the authority to arrest both parties if they couldn't determine who the primary aggressor was, right? Mandatory arrests, of course, began innocuously enough. They were created in response to police historically just like leaving the scene um, after they attended a domestic violence call and essentially telling couples to just calm down um, or tone it down, right? This left survivors at risk for increased violence at the or death at the hands of abusers as calling for help or attempting to leave frequently escalates the severity and lethality of violence. However, in an effort to treat domestic violence with more seriousness um, that had detrimental and traumatic effects for women of color, for girls of color, for child sexual abuse survivors of color, um, and LGBTQ survivors due to damaging stereotypes about Black women and women of color and LGBTQ folks. Um, 
you know, and so what often happened then is that um, in queer or same sex couples, police would often say, we're, we're going to arrest both of you because we can't tell who did what. Um, or for particularly Black and Latinx women, often the, the mythology is that Black women are um, never victims, right? And so um, we are strong and um, don't actually need any support. And so because we are inherently um, violent and angry ourselves that we actually should also be arrested because it's hard to tell which person was um doing the harm um and so that ended up putting survivors in jail right um and so what we've seen is that black lives matter activists to activists working in new york to pass the walking wall trans bill um survivors themselves are the ones drawing these connections between state and interpersonal violence and demanding alternatives to policing for the long-term safety of survivors. We're asking the field, what we're asking for is for folks to really see the bias and the violence in policing as more than just a few bad apples, but as a historical and present harm to Black folks, Indigenous folks, and people of color. For those of us who are survivors of color, there's virtually no separation between interpersonal violence and state violence. And for many, the relationship between social service agencies, police, and criminal legal systems is a manifestation of that reality. Um, next slide, please. And I see that there's some chat in the chat box. Um, and I'm really grateful for folks having this conversation. I can't follow along super well um, right now, but if there are questions, I know that folks will be collecting them so that we can um, chat a little bit more about them. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the radical visioning for the future. How do we um, as mainstream or even culturally specific organizations, how do we vision a future in which survivors of color are not collateral damage for the harms of the carceral state? What we know is that many grassroots anti-violence organizations that are led by communities of color and indigenous communities are leaning into collective caretaking, practices that center interdependence instead of independence, um, building community networks, reducing organizational hierarchy rooted in dominance, and we're doing healing work that's grounded in ancestral knowledge of body, of earth, of movement, and of song. Um, so uh, we'll talk first about culturally specific services. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So culturally specific services interrupt patterns of domination by ensuring that survivors from marginalized communities see ourselves not only as service recipients or clients or survivors, but also within leadership roles within these organizations and at all levels of service provision and decision making, from case managers to organizers to executive director to ultimately change agents, right? Um, what differentiates culturally specific services from organizations that may uh, serve a majority of a particular population includes a couple of things. So the first is within your culturally specific organization, who's in leadership and who has decision-making power? Is the board, is the advisory council, is organizational leadership a reflection of the community being served? Um, what is the level of integration of culturally specific practices. What kind of services are being provided and do they actually meet the stated needs of survivors within that community? Is culture an afterthought? So for example, merely translating documents into multiple languages versus creating content that resonates culturally with a specific or particular community. How are religious, dietary, cultural, musical norms, healing practices integrated in a cultural and culturally specific way? Um, the fourth question is who is being served, right? So do community members identify the organization as culturally specific? And does the community make up, this particular community make up a majority of the people who are receiving services? Um, and that's what, not every organization will be culturally specific, though all of our organizations should be striving to be culturally responsive, anti-racist, um, and decolonizing our work. Uh, next slide, please. Beautiful, transformative justice. 
So um, transformative justice is an alternative to punitive models of accountability that rely on the state. Um, and I hope that, you know, giving that kind of historical context about why, um, why survivors of color, why queer and trans survivors may have questions or concerns about engaging with the state, there's a lot of historical context for that. So I tried to give a brief overview, but I'll share too that, you know, historically the anti-violence field has been punitive in our responses to interpersonal violence. Um, punitive justice really relies on a crime and punishment model rather than healing and transformation. Again, the example of prosecutors, um, no drop rules, giving prosecutors the authority to move forward with cases where the survivor did not consent or has chosen not to participate in the process. The state then is seen as the victim, not the survivor themselves, right? The state is seen as the victim and the punishments are predetermined, right? And they may or may not meet the needs of the survivor and they may be doled out without survivor buy-in. This disempowering approach really puts the onus on survivors to offer proof, yet it removes their ability to consent or make decisions about their versions of justice and accountability. Further, it removes people who cause harm from the community with very little chance for their own rehabilitation and often disproportionately targets people who are already marginalized, leading to high recidivism rates. Finally, punitive approaches are often part of the driving factors for marginalized survivors, again, reluctance to engage with the criminal legal system and the social service organizations which scaffold them. Um, many survivors express, particularly survivors of color, express concern at prison systems or are reticent to engage with a system that further criminalizes them, their partners, and their own community. And transformative justice really is an alternative. Um, advocacy within transformative justice practices are centered on how to respond to violence in ways that acknowledge the complex history of both the harm doer and the survivor and seek to transform the root cause that caused harm to happen in the first place. Um, Mia Mingus uh, in 2019 described um, transformative justice as having three distinct tenets. So the first is do not rely on the state do not reinforce, the second is do not reinforce or perpetuate violence such as oppressive norms or vigilanteism. And three, actively cultivate the things that we know prevent violence, such as healing, accountability, resilience, and safety for all involved. These options are really designed and practiced with those who need more options and resources than perhaps what our mainstream um, services are able to provide to survivors who experience multiple marginalization. And I'll just share too that in Washington DC where we actually have you know multiple um, uh, programs for survivors who are looking for direct services, what we found is that um, in particular for those of us who are queer and trans survivors of color, um, there were very few places where we could go um, and both seek safety and services without feeling like we were throwing our community away. Um, and so we created um, an incubator of practice, right, for um, survivors of color who wanted to learn about transformative justice and to begin to implement transformative justice practices in collaboration with mainstream services. So we utilize the tenets of not engaging with the state and that is, of course, unless a survivor finds it necessary, right? We are not telling anyone not to engage. Um, we are just offering alternatives. Um, we try to do our work in a way that is holistic. And so um, uh, survivors not working with one case manager, they are working with a team and a community because what survivors often need to know is that the whole community has their back and that they're not alone. Um, and so survivors are working with a team that's collaborating to provide safety um, and a container of healing for their work. And um, we work with the harm doer, right? Which many of our, you know, working in mainstream services, many of our organizations do not. Um, and we work with the harm doer if they are willing and interested in making shifts and changes and up to, you know, the survivor's comfort. And so what we have found in that is that survivors have talked about feeling more empowered by the process, more in control, 
of the process. Um, and also just a note too, that this is, um, we are learning together um, and we are practicing together, right? We don't, I'm not suggesting that um, we have all of the answers, but what I am suggesting is that we know what hasn't worked. Um, and so um, we are trying to figure out new ways to provide safety and support to survivors that don't rely on state institutions if survivors are not willing to engage with those institutions. Next slide please. So survivor-led advocacy, um, which many of us are doing, but I think it's just really important to note. Oh, I, I also don't know why it says, um, yeah, recent experts in the interpersonal violence field were asked why they um, needed to, what they needed to do in order to advance. And so many of our responses really shift back to focusing on communities, right? So where are survivors taking leadership within your organization? Are we on the board? Um, are survivors, um, you know, uh, play unpaid roles or do we only call on survivors um, when we need someone that has a story to share or in our survivor speakers bureau, right? Do we have safety plans for survivors who might be on staff? Do we acknowledge that some of our staff may be survivors? So when we're thinking about survivor-led advocacy, we're not thinking about survivors and um, service providers as two separate groups of people. We're really seeing survivors as service providers ourselves, right? Um, survivors are capable and brilliant. Um, and while we don't have all of the, um, you know, not all survivors have the same lived experience, of course. Um, you know, I think that by having a coalition of survivors within leadership at, at our um, sexual assault organizations, we really shift the way we talk about the work. Um, and then last but not least is investing our investment in primary prevention. So these are four um, ways that I think um, our organizations move towards an advocacy that is more liberatory, an advocacy that um, really moves the needle on some of the work that we wanna see, which is ultimately ending sexual violence, right? Um, and so investing in primary prevention is um, my final thought on how we do that. Um, the aim of prevention is to interrupt the thoughts, the norms, the cultural messages, and the behaviors that allow or encourage violence. Um, so primary prevention includes education, it includes trainings, it includes public awareness campaigns, um, all of the things that are done before an individual act of violence has occurred. And it may be directed at a universal audience or it may be directed at a select audience, but the overall goal of primary prevention is to create a culture that does not rely on domination, on control or abuse. Um, primary prevention might come in the form of bystander intervention trainings, which teach community members how to spot aggressive behaviors and how to intervene nonviolently in interrupting harm. It may be training that promotes consent and nurturance culture within schools or universities. Um, it may be support which mobilizes men and boys or masculine identified people as allies to help interrupt patriarchal violence. Um, or it may be public awareness campaigns which raise consciousness about the prevalence of violence, work to shift behaviors, and then offering tools and resources. Currently, there's not a specific national number of victim service organizations that provide um, both individual advocacy and prevention activities, um, such as community education. However, anecdotally, I think we know, um, and I certainly know from my own experience as well, that pre prevention programs are often under-resourced and deprioritized um, in order to provide the life-saving services that respond to um, um, survivors' immediate crisis needs. Um, so if you know some amazing primary prevention programs in your state or around the country, I invite you to like en enter them in the chat box and shout them out. Um, what I think is also really important about each of these four interventions is that none of them require state intervention, right? We have within ourselves and within our organizations the capacity to divest from systems built to harm Black people and people of color and to invest in the things that keep us safe, housing, health care, fair wages, child care, supportive services, and community planning. Um, we have everything we need. Um, next slide. 
Um, I think maybe one more slide away. Yeah, that's the last one. Um, yeah, um, so I'll just leave with this, which is that divestment from the state is a mandate for survivor safety. Policing is not an inevitability. Um, state violence is not a necessary byproduct of keeping survivors safe. Um, part of how we reclaim and restore dignity of survivors is by honoring and working towards a world that's free from both interpersonal and state violence. Um, we will not end sexual assault. <laughs> we will never end sexual violence and patriarchal violence if we do not end the carceral state. Um, and I am convinced of that. Um, so I thank you <laughs> for your time um, and want to leave space for questions if folks have any, um, but just setting another moment of gratitude um, for uh, North Carolina Coalition for having me and also um, for y'all for your um, presence and your work in this space. Um, Deanna is going to share a few of the questions or comments in the chat, um, and I am here to, to listen. And thanks to our um, ASL interpreters who have been keeping up with me. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, as of right now, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat. Thank you to other NC CASA staff who were uh, taking taking care of that while I was sharing the slides. Um, okay, so uh, we do have one question um, from Daisy, pronouns they, them. What do you recommend for folks who are working in carcerally minded systems? I feel that I can't leave for my own finances. Absolutely. Daisy, thank you for that question. You know, I think that so I really feel you on not being able to leave for your own finances. Um, the nonprofit <laughs> system is already hard enough and our work is already probably underpaid um, and undervalued. And so just really sending a lot of empathy for that, for that question um, and knowing that for those of us who are primary providers for our families and our communities, that our livelihoods are incredibly important. My instinct would be to find allies within your organization if you are working within an organization or a system um, and start to build maybe a working group. Um, start to build like a community of folks within your organization who may just want to um, engage in some reading together, right? So can you can you develop a work group or a reading group or study group um, within your organization that can help folks get the language that they might need in order to understand some of these systems? Could that be an option um, for you all? Um, could we could we think about maybe bringing in outside speakers um, to talk to um, your team as a form of an in-service? for example. Um, and of course, this depends on the system. Working at an independent um, nonprofit versus working within a court system feels really different. So I'm happy to talk more, but I think that having allies within the organization, starting to do some like internal organizing and advocacy could be really helpful. Um, doing a reading or study group um, and finding maybe an organizational champion that can really get on board with, um, with values of like seeking alternatives could be really helpful as well. Hey, we've got two more questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, so the first one is from Casey, pronouns they, them. Um, and the question is, um, Alicia, what is your Venmo cash app so we can drop some money to you for your time and expertise today? That is so, Casey, that is so incredibly generous. Um, I would just ask that you donate to a local trans, Black trans-led organization in your community instead of me. Um, but thank you. I'm so just deep well of gratitude for that generous offer. Um, and please, yeah, please donate to some trans-led organizations. Yes, we deserve. Yes. Um, and I think there's one more question you yes. said. Yeah. Our 
opportunities for funding for restorative justice, economic justice, and other non-carceral system advocacies? Yes, yes, that is a great question. It's really hard. Um, what I'll say is that particularly for those of us who are working in mainstream organizations, there are so, you know, we're, we have um, our, our, the survivors that we're supporting, our organizational programs, really have begun to rely often on um, federal government funding through VAWA that comes down through our states and local governments or through FIPSA that comes down through our state and local governments. Um, and so it can be really hard to engage with um, foundation funding to do some practicing of some of these al alternative tactics. And sometimes within our federal government systems, there's not a lot of, um, funding for, for alternatives to policing, right? Because our the state is deeply invested in policing. So what I'll say is that yes, there are very small pots of money that may help you at least start to um, explore um, a small program or even do some like um, community level research um, for a pilot program in your community. Um, the pots are very small. Um, you know, Novo Foundation, for example, used to do a ton of that funding. Um, there are a few other like foundations like the Collective Future Fund that also fund some of that, um, some of that work. And um, someone's gonna be able to tell me in the chat, I bet, but Sujata Baliga also runs a, a, a fund that's specifically for folks who are exploring um, restorative and transformative justice alternatives. So very small amounts, but yes, they exist. <laughs> um, so yeah. We, um, we did have someone drop that in the chat. So just so you are aware, um, you all, um, I know there's some more questions coming in, but we did wanna draw your attention to the evaluation link that has been placed in the chat multiple times. So please take time to fill that out today. Um, we are at the, the 10 o'clock mark. Um, our next session starts at 1015 and we'll be um, here in the same space in the virtual ballroom. Um, if folks wanna step away and take a break, um, you're welcome to do so. If Alicia, you are open to taking these last two questions. Um, you know, I'll make, hopefully we can make space for those. Would you be open to that? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, right. I would be thrilled to answer them. And I, I actually finally am looking at the chat. Um, <laughs> I think that I see them. So the first is, how do you hold the balance of being an abolitionist and doing work in an environment steeped on white violence and carceral connections? My goodness. What an incredible question. Um, yeah, I think that abolition is a practice. It is not my identity. Um, and so I am in everything I do, I am practicing abolition from the most small interactions and the smallest, um, the most micro relationships, right? I am practicing non-domination, divestment from, um, like power institutions from the smallest interactions to my biggest interactions. Um, the fact is we work in an environment, we work in a culture, we live in a community, we live in a, a, a country, right, that is steeped in white violence and carcerality. Um, and so there's, there are in many ways no way to escape that reality, including sometimes within our own organizations. Um, particularly if our organizations are not, you know, culturally specific or um, doing anti-racism work. So the things that I do to take care of myself and take care of my community are that I find people that I feel connected to who share my values and um, sometimes my lived experience, but um, even if they don't share my lived experience, if they share my values, that can just be a really great support. Um, sometimes, um, in our work, we can be really isolated or within our cultural communities, we can be, you know, isolated. So finding folks that um, share my values and my politics is really helpful. Um, the internet is really helpful, particularly for those, um, for folks living in like rural, more rural communities. I've, um, we talk a lot of trash about the internet, but it's been such a great source of like connection um, and, um, and like 
being able to find a mirror for ourselves. And so that's been an incredibly helpful way to like learn about other people's practices. As we were developing our transformative justice hub here in DC, I looked to New York, right? I got training from Miriam Kaba. I looked to the Bay Area Transformative Justice Hub, and I couldn't have necessarily done that without um, being connected to folks online. So, um, so being online and like having an online community has also been a really helpful way to be, to practice abolition tenets um, in an environment that can be just really harmful for those of us who are living at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities as survivors ourselves. Um, and then Quinn, I see another question, um, which is about how agencies claiming to be survivor-led also need to treat staff and survivors as an overlapping group. Yes. Yeah. Um, I see this a lot as well with um, folks who see anti-racism work as like a thing we do for those people over there versus an internal, um, an internal practice, right? I always say we have to water our own grass. And so I think that um, a lot of our work about culture change within our organizations comes down to policies and procedures. <laughs> you know, the nitty gritty, right? What are our policies and procedures? So things that I used as an example include um, sick and safe leave for survivors within your organization. Um, policies on anti-harassment and consent within your organization. Do those things exist? Um, uh, you know, honoring and without stigma, um, survivors within your organization. I'm not gonna share the organization, but I had a job interview once. I was very, very young and I had one of my like first ever job interviews in the field and like with zero experience. <laughs> and um, I said to the person on the phone when they asked me why I wanted to work there and I said, oh, well, because I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. So like, I don't know, it just makes sense, I guess. <laughs> um, and I remember them telling me on the phone to never say that again, to never disclose that I'm a survivor again. And um, we sometimes silence survivors within the workplace because we don't believe that survivors can also be um, meaningful change agents and that they have to be, survivors have to be advocated on behalf of versus advocating for themselves. And so um, I think that there are so many ways to push for cultural change, including, um, you know, doing readings and possibly bringing in someone to help you think about what your policies and procedures are organizationally. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is just ask survivors. <laughs> um, you know, there are probably survivors in your organization who have an opinion about this. Um, and so um, if it's safe to do so, and of course, survivors have to also believe that it's safe for them to tell their truth. Um, and so if you're saying to me that there's no survivors in your organization and you are at a rape crisis center, um, my question would probably be why, why aren't survivors um, able to tell the truth? <laughs> because we're everywhere um, and in all spaces. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you all so much. I think I've answered all of the questions, but Chris can probably, or someone can tell you how to reach me if you have other questions. Just send, we're everywhere, Vicki. Yes, we are. Um, and we're leading change in every space that we're in. Um, so just deep gratitude to all of you for your work. Um, thank you for sharing this space with me. And I hope you get to enjoy a little bit of a break before you move into your next session.